Hello, and welcome to another presentation from the Academic Writing Program at the University of Maryland. I'm Linda McCree, Director of Academic Writing, and today we'll be considering what's referred to as the parts of a full argument, a method of arrangement from classical rhetorical theory. I'll review the six-part structure of a full argument, explain what each section seeks to accomplish, and consider how you might use this structure as a guideline for a fully developed argument paper. You'll have no trouble finding the parts of a full argument in evidence in all kinds of speeches and written arguments, from the time of Cicero to today. The sections have become a part of our heritage in the West, that is, they often seem natural to us. As always, the rhetorical situation should determine the specific parameters and choices of your argument and its structure. If, for instance, your audience is not familiar with your subject, you'll need to reshape the early parts of your composition to help inform them and pique their interest. If, on the other hand, they know a great deal about your subject, you'll want to be sure that they're inclined to think about, to think about the subject the way you do, that your audience is familiar with the concerns and concepts that you want to focus on. And if your audience disagrees with your position, you'll structure your argument differently than if they're likely to agree with your position. As with most heuristics and advice in rhetoric, there are various ways to consider the parts of an argument. Many classical teachers suggested varying advice. Aristotle, for instance, in his rhetoric, suggested there were really only two parts, the statement of the case and the proof. He suggested that anything else was an expansion of one of these, or may not be appropriate depending on the situation and type of discourse. At roughly the same time that Aristotle was teaching, however, other theorists, largely known as sophists, thought that there were at least four parts of an argument. The introduction, the narration or statement of the issue, the proof, and the conclusion. We'll be looking at a full six parts of the argument that in many ways could be thought of as an expansion of Aristotle's two parts, and in other ways offer a very different set of advice about how to think of an argument structure. What are they called? Here they are in English and in Latin, which demonstrates how much of an argument theory, how much, um, how much of argument theory really comes to us from Latin. So here's a more developed chart in the introduction our main goal is to establish exigence, to draw the reader into the audio, into the discourse. Then radio, or narration, offers a place for the retort to state, state the case, offer background and context for the topic. In the partition, you're forecasting your argument and providing your audience with an overview of the discourse to come, the way you're going to shape your argument. In the confirmation, you're providing your claims, evidence, and support and analysis for your arguments. In the refutation, you're considering any opposing arguments, and refuting them. And then in the conclusion, you're summarizing your claims, enhancing your ethos, and offering a closing, so what? Now again, I mentioned that depending on the rhetorical situation, um, these parts are going to be more or less emphasized, uh, longer or shorter, and they may even be in a different order. For instance, thinking about the conclusion. If you've written a fairly short piece, your conclusion doesn't really need to do much summary. You may still, may instead really focus on enhancing your ethos um, or enhancing the uh, appeal to pathos from your audience, to your audience rather. If you are speaking to an audience who um, disagrees with you, your refutation might come earlier. You may even touch on refutation in your introduction, and you may do a lot of refuting before you offer much confirmation. If you're speaking to an audience that really knows the story and agrees with the background and knows all the background in the topic that you're talking about, your narration may be uh, pretty short. Let's take a closer look at some of these parts, and we'll use the English names um, to describe them from here on out. The introduction, and I have to use the Latin word here as um, an etymological term, exordium loosely means beginning a web, and that's a nice metaphor to think of. This is the place where you've started to lay out the argument, and you're seeking to draw your reader in. Ensnare may seem uh, a little bit of a harsh metaphor there, um, but you're drawing your reader in, you're catching them, you're giving them some reason to, un to care about your audience. You're getting the reader's attention. And according to Cicero, the exordium should bring the mind of the audience to the proper condition to receive the rest of the discourse. In other words, you're disposing the audience to be receptive and attentive, and to care about your audience. Now you've all received lots of advice about introductions in the past. Um, let's move beyond some conventional wisdom. Again, the general point of, your, of any introduction is to establish the exigence for your argument. If your audience doesn't have a sense of why they should care about the topic, 
they're not going to be interested in reading further. You certainly want to think about establishing your ethos. Um, your audience wants to know that you are somebody credible to listen to or to read, or they're not going to be interested in spending their time with you in the argument. Here you're also giving your argument what we might call presence. Readers are inherently conservative, um, and they have to kind of really, um, they have to be persuaded that, an, that a topic is going to matter to them. So that's the place to use pathos, to give your to give the audience a sense that this audience, this argument matters to them, um, it's, it should be um, of concern to them. This is also the place to start to demonstrate that you understand your audience, that you understand their position. Um, you might be making concessions here. Um, and this is a place to start, again, using your ethos, but also your logos to demonstrate the way that you understand the way their logic works. So how to think about things in your introduction as you're writing it, some inventional questions. Does your paper clearly state a position or call for action? Do you use some meta-commentary to clarify your position? In other words, are you really not just stating the case, but really helping your audience understand why that case matters? Is your introduction too broad, um, or is the topic too broad? Does it need some qualification? Is it inciting some kind of action, or are you looking for some other um, result? Other, you're trying to persuade them of something different? And then you want to think about how your audience is going to react to your introduction. Will they be receptive to your argument? Will they, are they likely to be hostile? Are they likely to be indifferent? Might they be confused about the topic? Um, depending on your answer to those questions in blue, you're going to think you want to think differently about how you shape not only in your introduction, but the subsequent pieces as well. So a little more advice about tactics for introduction. Um, you've probably heard the advice before to use some kind of startling statistic or example to open your argument. That does that is effective. It does draw audiences in. It's a good um, good stickiness in your web. Um, you might also begin with the source of disagreement if you know that your audience is likely to either believe something different than you do or to know about um, a different point of view. You might start there with that um, point of disagreement to make it clear that you know what that point of disagreement is and to start to establish your ethos. You might quote from a well-known researcher in the field and either agree or disagree with, that, with the position that he or she holds. Again, establishing that you know um, something about the disagreement. You know a good deal about the disagreement, actually. And you might um, begin with agreed upon definitions, a way to start with common ground. You might also think about using your own experience to establish your ethos. That's a place where your experience in other evidence papers might reappear here in your final position paper. From the introduction, we move on to the narration. Narration, you know, is a telling of a story. Um, and the narratio, the narration, is the place where the retor, the arguer, um, offers their version of the story, of the background to the topic um, as they want it to be known, um, or as you want it to be known. What do you want your audience to know about this issue? What do you want them to have in mind as they're reading uh, your topic, as you're reading your argument? What do you want them to remember about the topic? And what might you include in your narration? Um, well, here you're really establishing the background on, on the subject. You're discussing trends, um, offering questions of existence, if there's any relevant court cases, so thinking about all those stasis questions. Which, which of those stases might you want to think about at this point? You might review relevant, recent, or controversial positions and research on the topic. And you might want to establish some common ground with your audience by defining terms. Remember, you want them to see the story, to see the background the same way that you do. And so any of those, any details that might do that belong in your narration. Following the narration, we have the partition. In the partition, the retour outlines what's going to follow in the argument, uh, naming the issues in the situation, providing some kind of preview of the way that the whole argument is going to unfold. You could think of your partition as a kind of roadmap for the audience to help them navigate through the development of the discourse. And you think again about the fact that um, this advice originally came from uh, advice about giving speeches. And think about uh, in when you're in a lecture class or in any kind of class, um, if the teacher says, these are the things we're going to cover today, that helps you know that what's coming up helps you anticipate the arguments. And if you can anticipate them, you can follow them better. So then what do we include in your partition? Here's the place to name the issues that are in dispute. 
specifically clarifying what does and what doesn't need to be addressed. What will you be addressing here today? Um, you might list the arguments to be used in the order that they're going to appear in your paper. The purpose of the partition is to have some kind of ethical effect on making the writer, making you seem intelligent, forthright, organized. It limits the scope of your paper. And again, it'll help, it's a way to help your audience anticipate what's coming. Three parts together, the introduction, the narration, and the partition might be considered the foundations of the argument. Now, it'd be wrong to say that um, the argument hasn't started yet, um, although often the next parts, the confirmation and the refutation, are refers to, referred to as the argument. But certainly we can see that in the introduction, the narration, and the partition, the use of rhetoric has definitely started. And you need to be rhetorically savvy about your rhetorical situation, who the audience is, what they might want or expect from your argument, um, what they may already know, the topic at hand. Um, all of those things are going to shape the way you start to structure and lay the foundation for this argument. And then I noted the next two parts, the confirmation and the refutation, are often considered the body, um, the, the main sections of the argument, the main body of the discourse. Here, it's really logical arguments that are emphasized. Why, why we used um, ethos, pathos, and logos in the earlier sections, really here logical arguments are emphasized. In the confirmation, you're offering claims and evidence that support your position. And in the refutation, you're countering these arguments, uh, countering arguments that others have made on the issue already. Even though in the order chart, confirmation and re refutation are listed in that order, confirmation first and refutation next. In fact, the order is really determined again by the rhetorical situation and not by the dictates of a plan or structure. In other words, whether you offer your claims for your support before you refute or you refute first, um, or even offer some offer them in an intermingled way, refute and then confirm, confirm and then refute, concede and do then more confirming. Um, how you structure this body section, these logical arguments, really is determined by the broader questions of the rhetorical situation. So then, in the confirmation, you're presenting arguments that confirm or validate the material presented in the narration and partition. You're using arguments derived from the stases and from the common topics, right? questions of conjecture, definition, cause and effect, quality, policy, jurisdiction, comparison, so forth. You're presenting data and testimony from reliable authorities to prove your argument's thesis. And this is the place where you're using all that research and all the claims that you've constructed, the claims, the evidence, and the analysis. That comes in the confirmation and refutation. Specifically in the refutation, you're anticipating arguments that might damage your ethos um, or your case if the audience um, agrees with those other arguments. Here's the place where you might also do some concession, the yes but, um, or yes, you're right to a point but. Um, and again, this can um, the refutation can be appearing in different parts in the argument. It's not um, strictly here at the following the confirmation. And then after we've had all those parts, we're at the conclusion. The, con the conclusion is the conclusion of the argument. It's the last chance to seal the deal with the audience. So what do you do in a con conclusion? Um, this is the place where you review the issues that have been covered. You emphasize any important findings, solutions, and so forth. This is also the place to enhance your ethos so that, again, the audience leaves the argument with a real identification to your position. It's also the place to think about using pathos to stir the audience's concerns and interests one more time before the argument is over. It's also a place where frequently in an academic paper, there's a statement that there's more work to be done. In other words, it's a place where, um, where we kind of suggest that the conversation needs to continue. If the introduction opened up the conversation, here we're encouraging, um, we're encouraging the conversation to continue. That makes a lot of sense in an academic paper where one of the um, pathos appeals would be to more thinking. That's often in the interest of, a, of an academic audience.